Good evening. Uh, welcome to everyone who is joining us today to the second of artist-led talks exploring the arts and crafts of Turkey. Uh, it is organized in collaboration by UNICEF Institute London and the Leighton House Museum. I'm very excited to welcome uh, a very special guest, Soraya Said. Um, she is a classically um, trained calligrapher and, of course, award-winning, um, a celebrated artist and a filmmaker. She's someone whose work is uh, well known to the wider community. So um, it is a great pleasure to welcome her in this platform. Uh, today we will start. Um, we will start talking. Um, about her project in the Leighton House uh, called Huria. Then we will continue her journey on the artistic path um, and her classical uh, calligraphy training in Istanbul. Uh, finally, we will return back to London um, about her projects just to learn about her direction uh, on her current uh, works. Um, if you have any questions, please do ask uh, along the conversation. I will try to include them. Uh, you don't have to wait till the uh, end of the talk uh, for the Q&A session. Uh, you are welcome to ask any time. Welcome, Sreya. Thank you. Um, yes, let's, let's start talking about your uh, project at Leighton House. Um, could you give us a brief background about that? So I thought it would be um, good to start with the Korea project, which I said at Leighton House Museum in 2013. And it's quite um, a significant project for me because it marks a departure um, from previous work, which was mainly created by myself in a solitary way. And it was also an opportunity to um, experiment and see what I could do by trying to take the calligraphy off the page and tell a story of it. So it was a wonderful experience to have the show at Leighton House Museum and to be in this space which was Lord Leighton's own private residence and to be surrounded by objects, ceramics that very much echoed my own journey uh, in becoming a calligrapher. And um, so why the word Huria? How, how, how did this start? The Huria is freedom in Arabic and I just was trying to think and um, meant quite a lot to me at the time when I came up with the project. I'm often questioned about whether I'm free pen, I'm a Muslim woman who others, and um, realised that freedom means very different things to different people. That's right. And also Korea as a form in Arabic calligraphy is it just looks very beautiful and also it is feminine in gender and I started to think about the ways I could um, bring Huria to life for me and so I thought through animation I could um, tell the journey of Huria how she starts as a little dot and then comes to form uh, a complete word Huria and then go back to, to the dot. Um, it would be great if perhaps we um, share the, the Vimeo links with everyone so that they could, in their own time, see the yeah. work that at the moment in this presentation I'm just sharing the stills. So it took me to over 1,300 frames that I had to write by hand um, which was quite an interesting experience and then to also push pen in directions I hadn't pushed before so it was very it was challenging um, and interesting to see 
the calligraphy so large and come to life. And then mm -hmm. another part of the, the project was to then collaborate with a choreographer, Salal Burgi, and to see how he would respond to the concept of freedom through dance. Oh. He's a, an Egyptian dancer and um, here's a still from his dance and you can see a picture of us at the opening night with Nitin Sawney, who's a well-known British Indian composer and um, yes. How, how do you, how do you um, connect music with calligraphy in your mind, I wonder? So how, yeah, how did you think that you could actually collaborate um, uh, with a choreographer and create such a work? I think first it was seeing, trying to see calligraphy in a three-dimensional way, and that's what kind of led to the conversation the choreographer and um, then the music came after that mm -hmm. so when I had the experience and uh, yes it was very um, I don't know if anyone who's listening attended the, the show but it'd be great to know what, what about it but it was uh, very well received I thought it was a very nice experience to work at Leighton House Museum with the team. Could you expand a little bit um, how, um, how was the preparation uh, process? Because it's, it's quite interesting that you, um, you wrote, you said, 1,300 times. Um, you know, um, I get some comments that um, people are very surprised how how difficult it must be? Because it was set up as a stop frame animation, you have to have every single movement yes. have to be repeated. So mm -hmm. it's like mm -hmm. watching it, any other sort of cartoon, if you like. It's, um, it's a very slow, meticulous process, which is something I'm used to. But um, going back to I mean, I needed all my training in order to get to that point where I was able to do this kind of collaborative work. Mm -hmm. And so I thought from, from, from the Clayton House Museum, we could perhaps go back to, to how I started in my, in my training. Um, well, when I looked at your project, um, I, it just reminded me of um, this proportion um, maybe a proportion that you use um, in the calligraphy, the kind of symmetry, proportion, and everything, and how it is um, in the Western world, uh, it always goes back to human posture and the proportion in the human body. Um, does it relate to that also? Well, very much so in, in calligraphy and even in geometry, which will mm -hmm. be. Um, to how I first started to study calligraphy, but I, yeah. I came to it um, through, I think I'm always asked, how did you come to calligraphy or become a calligrapher? And it's very difficult to answer, but I think I could probably pin it down a prayer that I made when I went for a first, my first Umrah with my family and I was yeah. Okay. about seven, eight, and I couldn't read Arabic and I couldn't write it and I was trying to read an English translation of the Quran and mm -hmm. quite frustrated by this experience I prayed that when I would next return to the Kaaba that I'd be able to read and write Arabic and as I did return um, and I was able to read and write Arabic. In fact, I was there in Saudi Arabia as a teacher of calligraphy. So that was quite um, a wonderful experience. But the mm -hmm. journey in the case started when I met my teacher, Ibdali bin Hodja. Yes, I was wondering how, how, how did you end up in Istanbul? So in 1999, a group of uh, Turkish artisans came to the UK 
as calligraphers, um, Mr. Nivlik was a woodworker, a metal worker, and his student, Ibrahim Bachelda. And they were touring the UK and also offering an apprenticeship, a two week apprenticeship. Okay. At the time, I was really searching for a teacher. I had come back from my degree in Arabic and I spent a year in Egypt where I started to learn calligraphy there. But my Egyptian calligrapher said to me, I've, I've taught you as much as I can, you need to go back to the UK and um, continue with, an, with another teacher. So I was searching for a teacher. And now husband at the time had heard of this apprenticeship and he wanted to go, but his boss, fortunately for me, wouldn't give him the time work. And um, so I was able to take his place and do the two apprenticeship at, um, in Norwich. And so there was a, a few of us uh, taking lessons with, with Dalit and Kilich Roger. And um, it was, well, it really sort of took off from there. Well, when you, when you mentioned uh, Eftelut and Klitsch, um, um, I, I remembered your Google project, actually. Um, in, in the video, we see you um, traveling and going to Istanbul um, and share your experience um, of this digital uh, form of calligraphy uh, with your master, Eftelut and Klitsch. Um, and we understand that it's a, it's a very close uh, relationship that you must have uh, developed. Um, so how was this, this master and student uh, relationship in calligraphy? Well, it's a very special one. It's, it's hard to put words to it, but uh, um, our two-week apprenticeship in 1999 in Norwich with Evdelin Hodja, um, I had already signed up to the masters at Pinsky School, so it's a Visual Islamic and Traditional Arts Masters course, and I thought that I could just send my work by post to Nelly mm. Roger from the UK because these are the days before um, scanning was very popular and so on. So, so I um, tried that. So while doing my masters and studying geometry with Professor Keith Critchlow and Paul Marchant. Um, in the time, I was really trying to keep up my practice and post the work to the Belladin Hodra in Istanbul. But this, this didn't quite work out, and so um, it was too slow. And as soon as there was a holiday during term time uh, at, uh, during my master's, I went to Istanbul for my first uh, ever trip, and that was in early 2000. And this photograph really marks um, the start of my journey in the Ottoman school of calligraphy. And it's actually, the, I think, it's, I remember it being the first place that Esteladin Hoca took me to, was to meet his master and introduce me to his master, Hassan Chelebi Hoca. And at this point, I was really becoming all tuned, if you like, by calligraphy. And I wanted to spend every waking moment practicing or looking at calligraphy. And um, I was even starting to see it in dreams and seeing compositions and dreams. And this was even before I was, I was just writing letters or for that, I was in many ways <laughs> accomplished as the start of the journey. And um, after mm -hmm. meeting Hassan Hoja, we walked to um, a cemetery, Karaj Ahmed Cemetery. And on the way to the cemetery, we, we were walking up, which I will discover later, was the Dalangela Jadisi, and we passed uh, a Mevlevi. Um, mausoleum which was a Mevlevi lodge and I could see inside as I walked past the calligraphy that I'd seen in my dream and it was kind of reassuring to me that okay I must be on the right path and as we continue 
um, we continued walking to Karaja Ahmed and Cemetery. And then Ibn Hoja showed me where Sheikh Hamdullah Effendi is buried. And he's believed to be the father of Ottoman calligraphy. And then he showed me also the grave of Hatat Hamid Effendi, who passed away in 1982. And that's his teacher. So it was like the first, before you really get into the lessons, I was being introduced <laughs> to the masters and being uh, made to be aware that this is part of a very serious journey and it's a huge commitment, honour, responsibility to be part of this heritage. Mm -hmm. So when I when I think of you um, in Istanbul, um, uh, I think automatically about different styles of calligraphy. Uh, as you know, um, every geographic location has its own style. Um, there is the Maghribi um, style, and then uh, you know there is all kind of other calligraphy styles. Um, um, and when it comes to um, Ottoman method, Ottoman style of calligraphy. Um, it's actually a school. You're, you're a continuation. You're continuation of a certain school, a certain movement. Um, were you aware of this at that time? Was it a conscious decision, or was it just, you know, you wanted to go ahead with the calligraphy that you met uh, in London before? Um, so. I mean, in terms of style, I don't think I really knew what the styles were called. Okay. I knew what they looked like. And so for example, mm -hmm. uh, when I mentioned composition in my dream, and I saw the piece, I later um, mm -hmm. realized that this was the, the boat composition of the Mantu Hadithan. Mm -hmm. and this is why I'm sort of showing this image, because years later, I wrote this. Um, it's a commission from the Cartwright Hall Gallery here in the UK. Um, but it was seeing the fuller script, the, the large cursive script as well as the seal, and that's the smaller script that really told me it's those two scripts that I am focused on and practiced. So this is one of my early uh, meshes or practice pieces which if Aladdin Hodja is correcting it's a combination of two letters together mm -hmm. and so I was learning between um, sometimes at a madrasa called Jaffa Jaffa is right next to the Ayah Sophia opposite Ayah Sophia and it was quite an amazing experience to just in a humbling one to go from just writing and practicing these letters and getting your corrections every week in front of everybody. And that's quite a, an experience to open yourself up so that everybody sees your mistakes as your hoja is correcting. And it's, it's a very good life experience, actually, because it prepares you for life, especially if you're an artist of any kind, if you're publishing something and it's going out to the public, then you have to be ready and accepting of the criticism you receive and just take what is good for you and, and kind of leave the rest. So I would, you know, go from Jafara Madrasa and have the opportunity to go to the Hagia Sophia. And these are calligraphic um, panels from the Hagia Sophia. And it just blew me away as a student to kind of see these masterpieces right right there and also trying to figure out how do you go from just writing these simple letters uh, to these these masterpieces it was so difficult for me to envisage how that happens so early on in the internship yes these these uh, wooden panels by um is that offendies is quite um um you know Everyone is just the first thing that they they see when you go into interior uh, on the upper wall um, uh, of the building. It's very impressive. 
Um, so, so how do you see, um, you said that you weren't aware of these calligraphy forms um, or styles at that time. Um, how, how, how you see these now, is it different from before? When you look at Maghrebi style, for example, um, do you feel like you want to go into that, um, specialize in that also? Or is it, how, how does it work for you? Well, they say that if you study Sulisan C, Sulisan then you are ready, you know, you can more or less go on to any other script after that because that's the most challenging. Okay. So I think that that's why it made sense to, to start with those two. Uh, and it took um, quite a few years of, of practicing and before, well, and once I finished my master's, Masters. Um, well, actually, in between, during my masters, um, I was just trying to still practice those connections and those letters by going every holiday if I could for a week to Istanbul and then come back. And then after my masters, I realised that I, I had to actually go and stay for a long time in Istanbul, and I didn't know how to do that. And it was still very early. I didn't know any other foreign and foreign students and um, after my masters my father actually came with me to Istanbul and it was winter it was Ramadan or Ramadan and um, mm -hmm. the intention was my father was going to help me find a place to stay for about three months so that I could continue my calligraphy studies and on the last um, day when my father was due to leave he just happened to speak to the man in the reception and explained the situation. The man at reception said, no problem, you can stay with my sister in Ayub Sultan. And within a couple of hours, I was sitting in a flat at Ayub Sultan with keys <laughs> to a flat and the Turkish family had uh, embraced me and adopted me for about three months. Um, I'm forever grateful for um, and, uh, it, it was great. I mean, it's so wonderful. I mean, that's the thing. Um, you know, we as calligraphy students, we owe it to so many people who have helped, who help us along the way, actually, because it is, it is a real struggle. And it's so nice when these things happen. And after those three months, I then got another invitation, and that was from um, Fatma Uzchai, who's a, an incredible illuminator. And um, she said, well, she wanted to improve her English. Why don't I stay with her for three months? So I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm happy, I'll stay with you for three months. And, How um, was it for you then? Sorry? It must be another struggle for you. Um, people are speaking in Turkish. Um, I'm yeah. not sure if you've taken any course or during well, your training. Initially, your I didn't take any um, formal Turkish lessons. Um, and that's partly because Estel Hoca spoke English and also I could... Yes. Speak a reasonable amount of Turk and um, Arabic. Mm -hmm. and, um, so I kind of muddled my way through initially. But um, anyway, the whole point was that I was supposed to speak English during the next <laughs> phase of my stay. But uh, in exchange, I was able to um, get up and work every morning uh, in the Uzchai studio. So before her brother's Osman and Mehmed Ustrai would come into their studio. I would go in and do my mesh and make sure I left before they even entered, um, which was a wonderful. Mm -hmm. Just to mention, not everyone knows um, about these people. Uh, all these people, actually, that you mentioned, is our uh, very well respected, uh, famous um, masters. Uh, you are very lucky, actually. You kind yeah. of continue that tradition. I think it was um, a very unique moment in time. As I say, there were hardly any other foreign students at that point. And um, mm. yes, it, it was a wonderful opportunity. And also, mm -hmm. um, then after that point, I got married and then moved properly to Istanbul. And this picture we see here is the, the view from uh, my apartment in Istanbul and I actually ended up li living on the 
Ich glaube, das ist die nächste Sache. 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 Uh, uh, by the way, I lived in the same district, Soraya, for about uh, three years. Um, uh, th that's, that's a really beautiful district uh, to practice such a, um, you know, uh, important... Uh, like Because also at the top of the road was a, a wax, and these are images from that um, Hassan Chelebi Hoja was teaching, and also Efdaluddin Hoja would teach there. And this is, these are three photos taken from one single lesson. So in one class, it was really um, color bollock, very crowded. I don't know if you get that sense from these three images. You know, you've got three teachers. Um, and at this point, and this photograph is taken from 2005, it's, you're getting all walks of life, all ages. It's almost like United Nations. We have a Japanese student there um, studying with Delivin Hodja and um, at the bottom we have Ines Furi, who's a, a Syrian calligrapher, and he's also. And so it's it's a wonderful experience to see all those different um, generations of calligraphers teaching at the same time and to learn from them at the same time. So it was in 2005 that. Um, Hassan Hoja said to Ifdaluddin Hoja that I was ready for the jaza. And um, it was quite a shock to me, and I think also a shock to Ifdaluddin Hoja. <laughs> and I hadn't had any time to prepare. I was told that I would, uh, need to, I basically had to write it during Ramadan. And um, so I, I chose um, a line in, in Tulluf and then I wrote in, you see, and this is the, the Ujaza you see before it's mounted. So I thought it would be, maybe benefit some students to hear the story of what happened to my Ujaza. <laughs> I wrote it during Ramadan, I got it signed and then I was going to mount it. And I was alone at the time. Um, my husband was away on a business trip, and um, I didn't want to bother anybody because it was Ramadan. And I thought I could mount it myself, as I've done it many times before. Uh, but unfortunately, the paper reacted very strangely. It wasn't my paper, it was a paper given to me by Hassan Telebi Hodja, and I wanted to do this paper but it really reacted badly to the other papers I was mounting to and it completely curled up and I managed to flatten it but then there were still bubbles. So I had to, I, I asked um, Osman Uzchai to help me, I asked them for the help with this because I knew that they restore you know, antique pieces of calligraphy all the time and they would know what to do. So you see in this picture, uh, Osman was try actually pulling, pulling the charter <laughs> off the back end. <laughs> I would never have the guts to do that, but he was just like, it was no, not a big deal for him. And um, you can see him sort of standing and pulling the bits of paper off from the back and just getting it back to house. And you can see in the background, uh, Mehmed was try there studying, um, looking at something or writing there. So while this was happening, um, another way of learning, you, especially in, in their workshop, they would be brought um, antique pieces of calligraphy for restoration. And um, this is possibly a, a Halusi Effendi piece, an early 20th century Turkish calligrapher. And it was just... So you had mm -hmm. Sorry? You had the chance to see all these uh, special pieces um, and get inspiration from. Definitely, and um, it's amazing. And also the way they were able to restore them and, and make them look amazing. Mm. Um, 
people often don't know that this 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 ijaza um, there isn't any ijaza. I mean, it's a, a certificate that you get. There isn't any specific time for that. Um, um, it 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 might be twenty years, or it might be like in your case, let's say six seven years. Um, uh, you never know, right? Yeah, that, that was definitely the case for me. I didn't know how many years it would take. Um, it took seven years, including the year I spent in Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, yes, you don't know, but I, I think when you're so involved in the practicing, you don't, it really wasn't a concern for me. I, I wasn't really um, interested, really. <laughs> I was just trying to improve and practice, and I think that's why it came as such a surprise. But this is um, the ceremony, and it's quite a prestigious event. I didn't realize how big it did, actually, but um, I don't know if you can also read captions, but you can see that um, we have it presented to me by uh, Princess Ushtan Ali, and then within Asan Olu, and Dr. Halit Erin, and it's... Um, we also have other Hoja presented on the same day, the Ijazas to their students. Uh, and so this took place in, in 2005. Are you the only female uh, student uh, in, in this ceremony who received uh, Ijaza? On that particular occasion, out of the six, I was in the theme. And it just shows you can see how crowded it is. There's lots yes. of people. And I think shows the image on the right because you can see, I can't really see it very well because it's been hidden by mm. um, but on, on the far right that's Lutfi Abi who took me in and his wife Haley are standing next to me and they're the ones who um, took me in and you can see um, Patak Hassan Chelebi and also um, in winter or Shehab Bulaki Murad as he's better known in the UK. And this is what the Ijaza looked like. It was illuminated by Fatma Uzchai. I had to wait two years for, for her to be free to, able to um, illuminate my Ijaza for me. So um, it's quite a collaborative work. It's, you know, I've written it. It's been signed by Ibdaladin Hoja and Hassan Hoja and uh, mounted by Fatma Uzchai and illuminated by Fatma Uzchai. <laughs> Okay. Um, just for our listeners, um, could you just shortly talk about the letter form difference when it comes to um, the Ottoman style of calligraphy? Um, so what are the main differences, um, you know, um, between this Ottoman style um, with, let's say, Maghribi style or any uh, what makes it so special, or what makes it different, distinct from uh, other styles? It's not an easy question to answer, but um, what an approach to calligraphy, especially with thuluth, is that um, thuluth is very amenable, you can really stretch the letters, so in, especially in terms of composition, and you can't do that with Maghrebi. And um, so that's why I think it's perhaps the favoured script I mean, calligraphers in that sense, because it, you can arrange it in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks for that. <laughs> this is um, one of the early works of Jali Phillips, Nuran Alan, that I wrote in 2005, so I've kind of come now back to London after receiving, not straight after, but um, I was expecting, we were expecting our first child, so we came back to London after, um, in 2006, and I continued to go to work uh, in, in, in my studio, in, in my house, and uh, it's quite difficult to be away in Istanbul and not have that opportunity just to 
um, see my Hoja or to see other calligraphy students. And um, yes, it was uh, quite a challenge. Are there any? I could just go through the. Um. Okay, not, not about your Istanbul work, but um, I, I received a question that, um, that about your Google project that we just um, mentioned. Um, so it says that you recently did a piece with Google, uh, I believe, again, using technology in some ways, uh, a modern approach to traditional art. Uh, do you seek uh, these more contemporary projects going forward? or are you still very much a traditionalist at heart, uh, or both equally? I guess, um, do you uh, try to stay in the boundaries, within the boundaries uh, of traditional art when it comes to uh, calligraphy work? We see you um, uh, taking all of this training that you um, did in Istanbul uh, into a different level. Um, so that's a very good question and the, if I go through these pictures it will get us to, to that, to the, the um, Google project as well as kind of it works and, and how it kind of shows maybe a sh shift in work but in short I'm still doing both so um, mm -hmm. I'm, doing, I'm working on the classical mission but um, I'm also working on other less classical uh, works as well. Uh, just a question comes to my mind, uh, Sreya. Um, I was wondering, um, so what do you think about the role of this digital work? You know, um, it might actually work against you in a way. Um, um, you know, people can just take your work and copy it's that's when it comes to digital technology and uh, making it uh, available for everyone online let's say and um, i think you could do that with, with with any kind of work as soon as you publish it it in fact becomes digital mm -hmm. but in a way what i like about what you see sometimes is some calligraphers on uh, Instagram, for example, um, they're so confident in their work, they know that nobody can imitate it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's true, to a trained eye, someone may try and copy it, but most, most calligraphers in the business will know that's a rip-off, and, and we'll know, we will know who, who mm -hmm. it belongs to. So that's, uh, I think, that's why I don't think it's taken too seriously. I see. <laughs> I'm just sharing a, a few of the works um, that I've done, traditional work I've done since moving back to the UK in 2006. And they're all sort of um, private commissions. And one of the calligraphers who I'm very much inspired by is um, Hamid Effendi. And in terms of the silsila or the, the calligraphic chain, so once you get your jazz and you now belong to a family of calligraphers and you can trust that with your teachers many generations. So I mentioned Hatat Hamid earlier on for his gravestone. And what I find very inspiring about him is that he was working at all, all different levels. So he was prolific, but was creating these great Quranic works, but at the same time he was doing business cards and logos. Mm. He was very creative uh, with his calligraphy. And it, for me, was a lesson how to serve people because that essentially is what a calligrapher is supposed to do, is, is serve. It's a service, the offering a service. Just, and, just mention when you, when you, um... When we were talking about this, I just remembered, you know, um, you showed um, um, the huge panels in the Hagia Sophia um, by um, the calligrapher Isaac Appendi. So he was himself also a composer, um, you know, a kind of musician, statesman, 
So it's not just, uh, even at that time, it's not just uh, you're a calligrapher, you have all other kind of uh, titles also. Mm -hmm. Yes. I need to as well. Perhaps the university has two lecturers as well as um, calligraphers. It's not just a sole practice. And as I, as the years started to pass and went um, from home and, and well, being in, in London, I started to question, well, what is um, what is the benefit that I'm offering? What is the service I'm offering as, as a, a calligrapher? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And being in a Muslim country, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's a difficult question to answer, and especially when you see that Muslims are not seen in a very favorable light. And, and it became a burning sort of uh, wish inside me that I could share this really beautiful art and um, I started to look at ways in which I could collaborate and see the calligraphy in, in different objects. So I'm showing here is a lamp and a, and a box and that, that box in the middle which is made by Hussam Tanivlik I mentioned earlier. And it is incredible um, silver metalwork and it's uh, yeah, I do recommend you you see him on uh, follow him on Instagram. It's very mm -hmm. and this kind of brings me to, I guess, an experimental piece, and this was a, a commission from uh, the museums. Um, mm -hmm. They actually asked me if I could choose one of their objects and respond to it. So that was, it was a very open brief. And um, I found a pen case in one of the, that they had in their collection. And I thought, well, this pen case has a history. Who does it belong to? What, what was written? What pens were dipped in? And the ink, what words did they write? And I wanted to kind of bring the, uh, the object to life, if you like, and using a, a holographic sort of piece of kit, I was able to place the, the pen case and the pens and have this 3D holographic animation play. And it, and it starts, it's called Pen and Sword, and letters start to build up into a tree. And then they cut down and the, the words pen and the sword disappear and at the end some more letters start to reappear from the, the tips of the pen and you can actually this is on show at the moment but I'm not sure I think the museum's open again on the 4th of July and it's on show at the Cartwright Hall Gallery in Bradford at the moment but if not um, there's also a Vimeo link where you can see the video. Do you think you'd be able to share those links on, on the chat so, you know, so that people can? Uh, I can't at the moment, but I'm sure we can find a way of sharing it on the social media, if that's okay. So an, an, another work was commission was from the Royal Shakespeare Company and they asked me to respond to a Shakespearean quote. This time it was a quote and I called it a deep sleep because it's, it's based on a section in um, the play where Prince Hal is sitting at his father's deathbed and he, his father is actually very deeply asleep, he's not dead. Um, and the prince is contemplating how he is going to be next in line and how that responsibility that he is going to now become king. And um, so I translated the quotation into Arabic and collaborated with, with the Foster Department at the Royal Shakespeare Company and we made this lovely brass crown. So you're talking um, 
about all your projects, you know, um, they all have a certain kind of story, a kind of like inspiration behind it. But um, so if we talk about Surya Said, uh, what's, what's your inspiration as an artist? Like what, what kind of books do you read? Um, you mentioned the calligrapher, but what else if we, if we uh, think of you as an artist? Um, well, it's, it, there's different things. I mean, if I'm mm -hmm. writing something classical, it's usually Quranic, so it's, it's the Quran, but often I'm actually commissioned by someone who needs something. So mm -hmm. it might be calligraphy for gravestone, it might be calligraphy for um, primitive uh, verse which reminds someone of uh, who has passed away and they like that verse it's a commitment to calligraphy um, but when doing my own projects is, is very rare actually because my personal projects don't sort of um, they, they take longer they, they take longer to do they take many years so in between my, my personal projects it's doing the balancing it with the commission project and mm -hmm. how I find inspiration is that I, I, I look for it. it, it just comes and I kind of hold on to the ideas that don't go away, that just kind of persist and nag at me that I have to work at it and develop it and mm -hmm. doors tend to open and it, it these things that sort of tend to they take life on, on their own. But when it comes to the, for example, the Google project, which I'm showing here, um, this was a, a commission that Google approached me to be one of um, a handful of artists to create work using the 3D VR um, tilt brush software that was for Ramadan 2018. And it's during that time when I was creating that work in VR that they started to find out about my story, about how I became a calligrapher, and they became very interested in it. And that's when they decided to make a short film about me and my project in village. And so they <clears throat> first sort of set me up doing the, the calligraphy in, in VR and uh, this is all shot in Istanbul, a studio in Istanbul. And I don't know if you can see in the, in the top left, it's quite funny, they cut out, out of the VR headset so that I can actually see what I was doing. But in the actual video, you don't see the holes in the headset. So in the, in the film, I then and uh, see a fellow in Hoja who's, who's actually, this is where he teaches in his Aachen, uh, which is a TA, a studio in Uskodar. So Ethel Hoja now teaches there. And so the film shows me Shell kind of made in VR and him experiencing VR for the first time, what he thinks of it. So what was your feeling when you first experienced calligraphy in digital form? Well, in, in VR, it's very challenging because I couldn't get the shapes that I can with a reed pen. So it was, you know, it, but it was a tool that couldn't really be used properly yet by um, a calligrapher. But maybe that has since changed. If you're doing sort of contemporary calligraphic art, it's perfect. But if you're trying to do traditional calligraphy, it's, it's definitely not there yet. But it, I mean, it was an amazing experience in the sense that you can step into this virtual world um, and in seconds create, you know, a letter that you can walk through, walk around, you can create a city of letters very quickly and just like 
click and change the color, the scale, rotate it, flip it, multiply it. I mean, if we're doing that on paper, it would take forever. So and it's quite an exciting experience, but it's, it's also a very different one. Um, so we have um, about 10 minutes and uh, if you allow me, I, I also wanted to ask um, some personal questions. Um, you already started talking what was the reason behind um, you trying um, digital technology in your work. Um, I wanted to ask as a British Muslim, um, just what are the key issues affecting your society? Uh, uh, what role does the artist have in society? Because I, I can see that you feel a responsibility when you're doing uh, all of these things. Well, I, I mean, I can't answer for every artist or every calligrapher, but only for myself. And mm -hmm. um, so, as I mentioned earlier, it's a huge responsibility to receive the calligraphy license and to be part of the, the family of calligraphers. Um, mm -hmm. Even though that means it's just the beginning, it just means that now you can really start the hard work of creating compositions and, what, and more elaborate calligraphic works. But um, I think I'm very much aware of my position being uh, a British Muslim and aware of um, the challenges Muslims face living in this country and I do take it as a personal responsibility to um, share this skill and also this art in the way that I think speaks to people in mm -hmm. this country in the west in non-muslim countries as well and in something very simple that um, Islam is not just for Muslims the Quran is not just for Muslims mm -hmm. <laughs> you know it's the beauty of almost silly to share the, the beautiful message that we, you know, that we believe in and um, the calligraphy is so beautiful and it's nice to be able to share it and to, to share it in different ways. I mean, if, uh, I think in my final slide, um, I end on the, the Cambridge Mosque and that was a quite an interesting uh, project in a way because it was mm -hmm. built by Mark Sparfield Architects. Mm -hmm. um, Professor Keith Pitchlow brought on as a consultant to help with some calligraphy that um, he wanted done. And um, he asked me to supply the design, the Kufic Square Kufic work that you see in the brickwork. And that sort of surrounds mm -hmm. all of the um, the mosque but it was an eye-opener just in terms of working with architects and sort of seeing how they suit and it was very interesting to see that they were using it within the brickwork and it's part of the structure if you like mm -hmm. it's not decorative piece of calligraphy that sits on the wall it's actually in the wall and um yeah i, I really kind of love that use of it. I mean, sadly, Professor Keith Lowe um, passed away last month. He said, and also, that he left that as David Marks, who passed away in 2017. So it's quite sad that neither of them got to see the final mosque, which opened officially last December. But many people will be experiencing um, the space um, and the beauty that you all created together. <laughs> I think it's a lovely building and also the, the Turkish calligraphy that's in there now is, is amazing and um, by Ali Toy, the calligraphy in the main frame which is provided by Turkey is, is stunning. So it's definitely worth a visit. Definitely, yeah. I, I was just also, it's just a very different um, 
um, experience when it comes to all of the uh, mosques, mosques across the country. Um, it's kind of the first, not only because it's an ecological mosque, it's also it's an eco mosque, but it's also um, it has a very different form, very different style uh, architecturally also. Uh, we have a question. Um, uh, we are running out of time, so I, I, I wanted to ask this. Um, uh, it says, does the evolution of your style into such light and free forms disturb the traditionalists in Turkey? Uh, your Google film suggests they love it. Uh, the underpinning of the classical training shows uh, through clearly. Dr. Amin. <laughs> I, 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 well, I wouldn't say it's loved. I've definitely received my fair share of criticism, uh, which is fine. Um, I think there's a place for purists and there's a place also for experimentation. Um, but it, it's all sort of the process of creating and learning. And it, it never ends and I'm still doing the classical work and even when I'm doing the more contemporary work, so even when I was working in VR, initially mm. I started uh, working in pen and ink on paper so that I understand what it is that I'm creating and I think that's where the frustration was that what I was creating on paper I couldn't replicate in, in VR. So I mean they're both very very different but um, I still managed to to do both and work with both. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. So, uh, but where do you see yourself in the next couple of years um, with your future projects? So, as well as doing the traditional work and pen and ink work, I'm also working on a feature film. And it's where I, there's a lot of calligraphy in it and it's telling a story uh, through calligraphy and also dance again. So um, yes, watch this space as they say. It might take a few years, but uh, <laughs> inshallah, slowly but, slowly but surely. <laughs> inshallah. So um, it's not related to what we're talking about, but um, I don't want to miss the, the questions as again. Um, we are coming towards the end of the uh, talk. Um, someone asked, why is it so difficult to find handwritten Quran? I think you can, um, well, they take many years to write for a start. I mean, that's, that's why, <laughs> the, I mean, it depends that they, they do get written, but um, very, it, it takes one or two years of full-time commitment to to write a Quran, a handwritten Quran. But uh, you can see plenty of them when you go to museums wherever you are in the world. They have them, so you can appreciate them that way, and uh, depending on where you are. I mean, in, in the UK and also in Ireland, there's some stunning um, Qurans in the Chester Beatty Library, for example, in Dublin. And they have many of them on show. Do you have students that are regular, actually? Um, yes, I have a, a handful of regular students, but I mm. send them to Istanbul if, if possible, because I still mm. think that it's the best place to be so that you can be surrounded by the calligraphy. And, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, not just, it's not just about the practice, it's about the looking as well. And, and being, you know, being able to absorb and to perceive the scale and proportions of clicker points in the building is very different to when it's on paper. So there's nothing quite like that, that and not seeing amongst lots of other calligraphy students and seeing how they're progressing and what, how they're struggling too. But, um, it'd be interesting to know how much it's changed now for students there in Istanbul from the time when I was there. Yes. <laughs> okay, so um, thanks for joining us, Raya, and thanks for everyone uh, for the questions and comments.
Thank you to Leighton House Museum and to the Eunice Emory Institute for the invitation.